colleagues in the University of Tours in 1998 after several positions, uh, for instance in GPS and Geneva. He became professor in 2015 at the Rheinisch Westfälische Technische Hochschule in Aachen. Uh, to Jonas main scientific interest regards the uh, cosmological models, the cosmic uh, wide wave background, the theory of large scale structures in the universe. He's also an expert in particle physics and on the characterization, characterization of dark matter. Today we will hear about a theoretical and computational challenge, learning about the dark universe from cosmological linear perturbations. We are looking forward to your talk. Some numbers characterizing the topology, 
of uh, the nonlinear structure. There are lots of objects you can build in order to compensate with these observations. And numerical tools are much more expensive, of course. You have embodied codes like gadgets, the hydrogen codes, or RAPSES. I think you heard about that last week from uh, Roman Tessier. So I think it's very good that the two colloquia are one after each other because they really develop the uh, nonlinear part. And now I'm there to convince you that ah, the nonlinear part is also not so trivial and not completely um, solved, right? not completely optimized. Okay, uh, so this is about the simulation, uh, but of course there is also some very, very nice theoretical activity trying to tackle the problem from the analytic or semi-analytical point of view, at least on some quasi-linear scale. There are various groups working on that, including the group of, of Matthias here. Okay, so linear theory uh, is indeed relatively simple and has been amazingly successful. Using so the, the, most of what we know about cosmological parameters and about the uh, success of the lambda CDM model comes from linear scales. And linear scales have been uh, extremely powerful and extremely successful in explaining the data. So this was of course, this is particularly well illustrated with looking at CMB only, uh, with the recent results, results of Planck. Uh, note that with the Planck release of last year, we had new ways to uh, test independently the success of the lambda CDM model, because for the first time we had a, a rather accurate map of CMB polarization. So uh, now from Planck, we have essentially three observables. The map of temperature, the map of polarization, and the map of the enzyme potential that you extract from the other two maps by looking at some sophisticated uh, statistical estimators beyond, beyond the Gaussian level. Because uh, CMB lensing is an effect which enters at second order interpretation theory. And so, with this data, we can do some new consistency checks of the minimal cosmological model. And, ah, I touched the uh, Wrong button, yeah. And it works so well. So these are the main observables you construct from the ground data. It's the autocorrelation spectrum of temperature, polarization, and CMB lensing. And there is one interesting cross-correlation spectrum. Interesting in the sense that it's not completely negligible like other uh, correlations. And it contains again some additional information because Temperature and polarization are not fully correlated, they are not uncorrelated, they are in between, they are partially correlated. And the cosmological model predicts by how much they are correlated in such a way that you can really consider this as a data set providing independent information with respect to the other two. Okay, and uh, this uh, figure, of course, is a very good illustration of the success of linear theory in the sense that. The uh, red curve that you see here, or black curve here, is not the fit of the data point, uh, it's just the prediction of lambda CDM once you only try to fit the temperature spectrum. So by fitting the temperature spectrum, you get the best fitting model, which has this red curve, and then for the same cosmological parameter, the prediction you get for TBB and CMB lensing are a beautiful match of the data points. So extremely interesting. And you can check also the, that everything works well when you look at this 300 plot of all possible two dimensional germ contours on pairs of cosmological parameters. Um, the different colors, uh, the green, gray, and red, correspond to trying to fit only one of the spectra. And if the theory was not working so well, it would not be granted at all that the contours would overlap. But they beautifully overlap. So you can even combine all the data and this gives the, the blue contours and it's absolutely amazing. I think that really 10 years ago nobody would have bet that a, a, such a simple six-parameter model would fit so well all these data sets. I did a small exercise just this morning before coming. I computed the, in, the factor by which the allowed volume in the six-dimensional parameter space of lambda CDM has shrunk between the first 
data release of W1 and the last data release of Quark. So doing that is, uh, is a little bit more complicated than just multiplying the one sigma and one bars because you have to take into account the degeneracies. So you need to go to a parameter basis in which the, uh, the isocontour uh, ellipses, ellipsoids um, are orthogonal to the axis. In this basis, you can multiply the error bar to compute the, the, how, by how much the allowed volume has decreased. And what would you bet? What would be your bet for the, this factor here? Try to think about it. Between doubling my first year, so that was 2003, and now. Well, it's a factor of 4, 10 to the 5. We don't realize because we usually see the progress for each parameter and you think, ah, yeah, it's a factor. Or five, but when you multiply all, all that, it's a huge improvement. And what is really amazing is that with double map, we started to establish this very simple model with six parameters. Okay? Most people would have thought that this was a first order description of something more complicated. Now we have this volume, the volume shrinks by 4 10 to the 5, it's a huge, uh, huge shrinking. Now have a tiny yellow region compared to what we have before, and the six parameter lambda CM is still a very good thing. It's really amazing. It's really amazing how robust this lambda CM model is. Okay, um, linear theory was very successful. Also, when you consider CMB data and in combination with other uh, data on background expansion, except this famous tension with a direct measurement of H0, which is now the 3.5 sigma level when you look at the last paper of, of the reset group. Is this a systematic? Is this uh, an issue with not using the correct model? Well, this is uh, really intriguing and could be really an issue with the model because as you know the CMB is not doing a direct measurement of H0. The H0 you infer from the CMB is obtained by extrapolating the model that you use to fit uh, the CMB data. And the extrapolation in the lambda CDM case gives, uh, from plant data, gives the result really intention now with uh, the measurement, direct measurement of H0. So this plot from the reset papers suggests some simple solution. And the idea that the one working better is to increase delta NF's effective neutrino number. And if you had, for instance, one false neutrino species of sterile neutrinos. It's not as simple uh, as this. Simple solutions usually don't work. For instance, uh, uh, in the plant collaboration, we are not at all convinced that increasing NF is a solution to this problem because it brings other problems. If you look at this plot from the plant data, it shows the NF H0 degeneracy. When you use uh, temperature data alone, a low scale polarization, you have these very elongated uh, contours here. Uh, and indeed, by increasing an F, you can increase H0. This is just the expense of, for instance, increasing the loss in miles, so the amplitude of the matter power spectrum uh, on small scale, on galaxy scales. And really, the data on large scale structure doesn't want that. The sigma you get from Prom tends to be already too large, so it makes the tension even bigger. So I think that simple solutions like that do not work. But we will see during the colloquia more complicated model which can resolve this tension. Okay, very good agreement also between what we infer on linear scale from the CMB and from uh, the linear data on large scale structures, so using only the larger scales. The uh, best fit on the CDM model is in agreement with data on galaxy correlation function, cosmic shear, cluster mass function. There are also small tension on the value of sigma precisely, but they are marginal to two, three sigma level. I don't think it's a reason for uh, dropping lambda sigma. Just we have to be aware. Okay, so this was uh, about the success of linear theory. Now, can we do high precision cosmology with non-linear theory? Are we, are we ready for that? Well, there are lots of problems. Anybody codes have done in incredible pro progresses in any particular gadget. But still, because they are so slow with respect to Boltzmann and Schein-Solver, you cannot use them within a full Monte Carlo map of chain when you feed the data. Of course, it's completely irrealistic. Instead, you could try during this process to use fitting formulas 
that would have been calibrated on your MOD simulations. But it's the same. If you want a fitting formula, you need first to run a suit of simulation. I'm going to show you that now popular dark matter or models or models of modified gravity are so complicated, they have so many free parameters that it's completely realistic to derive a fitting formula for all of them, especially all of them in combination. So fitting formulas will remain good too for some restricted class of model, but you cannot use them like Boltzmann code, which you can really run within the Monte Carlo Markov chain for parameter extraction for any model that you want. And of course, when you deal with nonlinear scales, you have these uncertainties on baryonic effects. So it's clear that if you have a cosmological model which predicts a deviation from lambda CDM, which could be degenerate with a baryonic effect, you are in a bad shape for learning about this model in the future because it's so hard to understand, to model this, all, all these binary physics. Same with the physics of star formation, with bias issues, etc. So one way to get rid of all these problems would be to rely on future parameter extraction, on analytical methods, on, on the quasi nonlinear scales, so effective fields, uh, um, effective theory of large-scale structure, renormalization scheme, resurmation schemes, they are extremely promising direction, but they require a lot of work and uh, I don't think that any group now can claim that they are ready to use their methods in an efficient way for all the range of models that are interesting to fit to the data. We see a very long way to go. This is uh, also very difficult analytically and computationally. Okay, so I come back to the message I want to give. So, at this point, with all that I've told you, I, I went in the direction of, of these claims. It seems to me that cosmological perturbation on linear scales is completely understood, very constrained, and that there is not much work to do in this area, while we really need the community to work hard on linear scales. This would be true without taking into account all the recent developments in particle physics, astroparticle physics, and theoretical cosmology, because as you will see, the imagination of theorists has exploded in the field, and uh, also there are good motivations for that. So there is more potential complexity in the cosmological model that we want to compare to the data than some years ago. And I will take three examples: the dark matter sector, the sector of light relics, and the sector of dark energy and modified standard. As far as dark matter models, uh, is, uh, as far as the dark matter sector is concerned, uh, the life of cosmologists a uh, uh, decade or ago was easy because there was really a dominant paradigm, which was a wind paradigm, with the main motivation being the neutralino for supersymmetry. It behaved like a very boring cold dark matter uh, particle. If you want to learn on this model from cosmological observation, you only are interested in a uh, calculation of the relic density omega CD. And the wind scenario always has some challenges, like the action scenario. Action could behave as warm or cold particles. If they behave as cold particles, it's not obvious that you can differentiate them from, from winds. Another challenger is stellar neutrino, which would behave as warm dark matter. So they were these big categories of models some years ago, not so complicated. But we still have no evidence from WIMS, in spite of many uh, experiments in an accelerator, in direct searches, okay, in underground laboratories, and in indirect searches in cosmic ray gamma ray experiments. And from LHC, we still have no evidence for supersymmetry. There is no proof that supersymmetry is wrong. But the motivations for supersymmetry keep on decreasing. So there was some excitement at certain some months ago with some potential signal that would be interesting to explain. There will be an update soon. Nowadays, the rumors from the last days are that this might go away. I'm not sure. So it becomes more and more difficult to. Uh, to have a, a simple model, like simple WIMPs, being compatible with all the data we have. It starts to be 
surprising that we have not seen it. Although there, is, there are still some uh, corners in parameter space which are uh, not explored, but it's getting smaller and smaller. So, given this situation, the mentality of uh, particle theories has changed a lot in the past 10 years. And there have been a, an incredible amount of new models proposed with a new approach, a new philosophy. Now it's, it has become one of the main activities of theoretical particle physicists. Uh, before, maybe it was the unification of uh, gauge constants and the solution of the hierarchy problems and CP population, etc. Now, the dark matter building is, a, is, is uh, playing a very central role in, in theoretical physics. And the new philosophy is not so much to look for a dark matter candidate, but to build the dark sector. Indeed, uh, you have to struggle a bit if you want to have a nice dark matter model availing all current constructs. And people started to uh, explore all the possibilities remaining. And there are many, many such possibilities. And in particular, if you don't rely on supersymmetry and uh, you want a dark matter model that you can test, you can start from postulating a new gauge group, a new interaction. And this new gauge group, that you call your dark gauge group, will come with new particles. There will be new gauge bosons mediating new forces and new particles that will live under a representation of this gauge group. And we hope that some of them are charged under both the visible sector and the dark matter sector, so that there are some interactions between the two, and that we can test these models. So, with this kind of models, the dark sector is much more complicated than the simple wind model, for instance, because you have several particles. Some could play the role of dark matter, some could play the role of dark radiation, which means relativistic relics. You could have easily a coexistence of several dark matter and dark radiation particles. You could have interactions between them, and you could have interactions between the particles of the dark sector and of the visible sector. And this is regarded nowadays as something uh, rather uh, natural. There are many models of the market, and the idea also is that the visible sector is so complicated. We have, there are so many particles in the standard model of particles. And among these particles, many play a cosmological role, right? In order to explain the CMD and large scale structure, we need to evoke neutrons, protons, electrons, photons, neutrinos. So about 10 particles. So there are 10, about 10 particles in the visible sector, which are really relevant for cosmology. You cannot explain, uh, understand and understand without each other. So why in the dark sector should, should we rely on just one dark matter relic with boring properties? So this point of view is, is very popular, and that's why there are so many models now, with lots of parameters. And some people are already trying to put some order. For instance, there is a, a nice idea of a group of uh, C-Code metal, or c c metal, of trying to classify all of these dark matter models, which have different possible couplings. They call this ethos, the effective theory of structure formation. So now, in order to sound fashionable, you should have effective in, in the title of your uh, new paper or new theory, but the idea behind is very nice, is that you can do a systematic classification of uh, the parameters relevant for cosmology, the parameters of the dark matter sector, relevant for cosmology. And so these models can be tested with accelerators, cosmic rays, and cosmology. And let me take two examples, uh, taken from my work, I'm sorry. Okay, so first is a model of dark matter interacting with dark radiation with a given expression for the momentum transfer rate. This model um, has been introduced because uh, it has good motivations uh, from the particle physics point of view. It has non trivial signature at LHC, and this momentum transfer rate is not something completely generic, but it's something you get uh, under some basic assumptions. So I'm not going to enter into detail, but it's like I said before, you introduce a dark gauge group with dark gauge bosons and, and, and uh, new fermions. You assume some uh, particular scattering between dark matter and your relic light particles, which plays a role of dark radiation, and then you get this momentum transfer rate. And that's very interesting because this transfer rate scales exactly like the Hubble rate during radiation domination. And this means that the effect will be that you get 
a constant, a constant interaction strength between dark matter and dark radiation during radiation domination. And so this interaction rate could be small, but over time it could develop a cumulative effect. And so with this model, uh, what is important is that you have an effect of dark radiation drag on the dark matter. It means that the dark radiation does not cluster because it's relativistic particles, and it prevents dark matter particles from clustering too much. And this is a very small and regular effect during radiation domination, in such a way that you get a suppression of the matter power spectrum. This is a matter power spectrum of such a model divided by lambda CDM, and it has a non trivial shape, actually. You could think that it's like for neutrinos, but in fact it's quite different. And you see that already on linear scales you get a, a big departure from lambda CD. And this model is very nice because it reconciles CMD with NBAO data with a low value of H0 and a low value of sigma. But it's just one example taken out of 20, 30 cases which have been studied in the literature because you can have many types of interaction between dark matter and dark radiation with different momentum transfer rates and also between dark matter and particles in the visible sector. So there is a very rich phenomenology. Same if dark radiation uh, would be decaying. Uh, I'm going here to, to show a model in which dark matter decays into neutrinos or some dark radiation species. This is interesting because it would have a detectable effect only gravitationally, only through cosmological data. And there are many particle physics motivations for that. I just take one example. Suppose that dark matter is made of primordial black holes. Primordial black holes tend to merge when they meet each other. The shots that they merge, they form a new black hole with a mass which is smaller than the sum of the previous two masses. So the mass budget in dark matter has decreased during the merging. But the energy is conserved because the energy has produced gravitational waves. And gravitational waves are dark, dark radiation. So this is an example of a model in which a fraction of the dark matter tends to decay to dark radiation. And there are many other examples where this happens. So in the recent work, we did a joint analysis of two parameters, the lifetime of the decaying dark matter particle and the fraction of the total dark matter which decays. And this is motivated by many scenarios and it has a very rich phenomenology. You can derive nice conclusions from that, like the fact that, for instance, if dark matter decays between recombination and today, up to 4% of dark matter can go away without violating any bound from the quantum data. It's a big number because of a surprise. You can have 4% of your dark matter vanishing between uh, recombination and today, going into dark radiation. This is perfectly consistent with the data. So these are just two examples, but you see that you can play a lot with dark matter models. You can play a lot also with the light unit sector, with good motivation, which is, for instance, the fact that there are some serious hints of light serial neutrinos from short baseline oscillation experiments. So all these experiments which look at neutrino oscillation in accelerator, in underground laboratories, tend to find some anomaly, some appearance or anomalous appearance or disappearance of neutrinos and also the situation is a bit messy and a bit contradictory and also the, the experiment which had been built for checking this mini boom was not sensitive enough to draw a very firm conclusion this anomaly remains and actually in the US they keep funding new experiments to check that will be an experiment to check mini boom um, there are plenty of motivation for light relics in the universe, for string theory also. So there is a very rich phenomenology in the sector of light relics and many models you want to test and they come with their own free parameter. And of course it's the same in the sector of dark energy, modifying edge time gravity. Light for that matter, I should take several examples to show you that the model we had in mind when testing the idea of dark energy 10, 15 years ago were a bit naive, they didn't have so many parameters, they were a bit naive, they suffered from uh, inconsistencies at the fundamental level. Now there has been a lot of progress, the Heidelberg group is, uh, is leading in this field, and people can derive now either some fully consistent model of modified gravity, which are really built from scratch and have no problems, no theoretical problems, or they can use 
use of phenomenological approach to explore systematically what is the range of Lagrangians that you could use to describe modifications of gravity. And in all this model, you come with a prediction for the matter power spectrum with again departure from the CDM, also a linear space. Okay, so given this very wide range of models, we can wonder if we have enough information, relevant information on linear scales in order to learn something. And indeed, linear scales are sufficient to test the nitrogen sector, the dark matter sector, the modified machine gravity sector, because for all these models, it is rather natural to have modification, for instance, in the matter power spectrum, if not in the CMB spectrum, on linear scales. And the most familiar example is neutrino mass. I like to highlight this because many especially in the astrophysics community, many people believe that the effect of neutrino mass is only big enough on nonlinear scales. So that we have a problem that if in order to measure the neutrino mass from astrophysical data, we need to have nonlinear scales very well in the control. We did many quantitative tests of this, in particular in this paper, to show that really most of the information we will use with Euclid or LSST or experiments like that, in order to constrain the neutrino mass, most of the relevant information is in linear scales. The effect of neutrinos comes into play on linear scales, and so of course if you have uh, very good control of non-linear scales, you will get better bounds, but most claim in the literature that you can detect the neutrino mass with future large-scale structure experiments rely on linear scales, and so are free of issues regarding parionic feedback and this kind of things. But this is true for most of the models that I discussed before. What we cannot test if we only have linear scales are models of one dark matter or very early dark matter interaction. If dark matter has a weird behavior only at very high redshift, then it will modify only small scales. This is illustrated with these plots of the matter power spectrum of small scales in models in which dark matter interacts with dark radiation at very early times and leads to dark oscillations. This is something that you can test only with nonlinear scales, but it's only a restricted category of interesting dark matter models. Okay, so there are things to measure with linear scales, and future data will improve incredibly with large scale structure and future planned or proposed CMB missions. The error bar on linear scale will decrease a lot. So there is a big potential of discovery. All the models that I mentioned before can be constrained much better, or we still have a chance to find that one of them, or a combination of them, is a better fit to the data. And so in summary, of course I'm not saying that non-linear scales are not interesting, not at all. They are really a priority. But already linear, using linear scales, we will have a big potential of discovery, and we will be free of all the issues that I mentioned before about astrophysical uncertainty and numerical problems. So we want to do that in the first place. And now, are we ready? I don't think so. If you look, for instance, at what we have done uh, in the plant papers, our goal was really to do much more than in previous collaboration, explore many more models in order to have as much of the scientific potential of the data exploited by the collaboration itself. If you think about it, in the dark matter sector, in the plant paper, despite the very, very heavy work, really, people did all what they could, there is only one non standard model of dark matter tested in the plant paper. Only one model with non trivial nitrogen sector, steroid neutrino. And there was a heroic effort, uh, led by Valeria Petorino here, of looking at more models of modified Einstein gravity. So in the plant paper, you find about five models explored with to five free parameters on top of lambda CD. And this was an incredible default on the numerical side. But this is not so much at the end when you look at all, what, all the nice models that have been proposed and well motivated. So I think that we need to be much more ambitious with future data sets like Euclid or SKA or Core Plus, it is using the CMP satellite, is approved. We cannot, because the error bar will be so much smaller, the, the, the discovery potential will be so much bigger, we need to do much more. We need to be able easily 
a researcher with uh, the cluster of his university should be able to do easily something much more ambitious. Instead of running on uh, over one or two weeks, like we did for Planck, about 20 models, with six to eight parameters, a bit more for some uh, modified gravity model, we should have a much bigger grid of models, like I showed before, with many more free parameters. And in it, uh, you can say that you will focus on the light relic sector, on the dark matter sector. But if you have a good motivation that, for instance, neutrinos have a small mass, and there is a short baseline anomaly to explain. And maybe there will be some hint of some dark matter uh, model in, in the near future. With all these hints, we will be forced to explore at the same time some combination of a non-trivial dark matter sector, a non-trivial uh, light relic sector, etc. And it will make things much more complicated. Are we ready for that? Do we have some good tools for calculating the theory? So indeed we have some well-tested public codes and uh, in particular, so I work on the class project which was uh, initiated uh, for the Chrome collaboration in order to have more than one very accurate code, more than Chrome, in order to uh, extract information from the data. So the class code is the Boltzmann code that was uh, developed with the goal of modularity, accuracy, speed. But for what I'm talking about, there is first an issue of integration of many models in the same code. In principle, if you want to do this uh, ambitious analysis, you want to have all the models of interesting models embedded in the same code and not in multiple versions of COM here and there. So, class is a, is a code which is really adapted to that because it has a philosophy that you can add up without messing up. It contains lots of physical ingredients. By ingredient, I mean new species or new observables or new analytic approximation, new ways to compute. But they are always uh, labeled by flags and within conditional loops like that. So that in class we tend to accumulate all the models that we know. And it doesn't make the, the code unreadable or slow, because when we execute it, if we only have three ingredients turned on, all the other lines will be ignored. And also because if you are interested in one ingredient, you will immediately localize all the relevant equations in the code. This is not something you can do with competing codes. So class already has more models and observables than Kong, many more, and we are uh, developing this in particular. Um, uh, some people based essentially here and, and in Barcelona, Miguel uh, Fumanakaregui, Emilio Bellini, Nassim Saviki, have recently published a branch of class called High Class, which embeds a very large number of models of uh, modified Einstein gravity in a very consistent way. And they are still making progress on this code because you have to face very big numerical challenge for that. So there was this issue of integration. This I think we are uh, in the way to solve it. Issue of code comparison. It's a thing that class and comp have been compared to very, very good accuracy level for lambda CDM, but not for an extensive range of complicated models. So in the future, I think we should aim at having always two uh, Boltzmann codes, solving all models in order to be able to do comparison. But what I want to insist on is the issue of performance of these codes on modern clusters. The default execution time of class and comp first, the, the performance of class and comp in, ta in terms of time depends on exactly what model and what processor you use for doing the comparison, but roughly it's the same. Okay? Class is not faster and not slower. The default execution time of, of class uh, is rather small, 6 divided by n core seconds, up to 8 cores only, because like Kong, it scales well only up to 8 cores. After you, you really get worse uh, performances. But this is with default precision. In the future, we will be trying to feed data from, for instance, Euclid and Corpus, and we have to increase the precision setting in such a way that the computing time will be something like 30 seconds divided by number of cores. That starts to be a lot. And for experiment, future last case structure experiments, we need to compute many more of the levels. We need to compute, for instance, the, matter, the, the density spectrum or the cosmic shear spectrum in very thin shells in redshift space. And this is very expensive in many cases. So that could be one order of magnitude more in computing time. And then we have a problem. Then it means that in total, the code will be 
become maybe 100 times slower than nowadays, and we really have a problem for extracting parameters. So what can be improved? There are many ideas, and a promising one is to try to start using an offload of calculation to these accelerators, these new CPUs with a new architecture in which you can vectorize or parallelize some very basic operations on many, many ports, like zero phi or graphical, um, graphical processing units. So this is an interesting uh, direction, but I think that it's even more exciting. I think that if we want to face this challenge, we need to change the basic principle of the calculation of those one ports. Because otherwise, we cannot get the code scaling very well. I take one example, because I'm running out of time, so I start to select one and read five points. Uh, I take one example. Uh, in the Boltzmann code, you integrate web numbers after each uh, 40 modes, one after each other, and there is no problem to distribute the 40 modes on many codes. So this is very well uh, parallelizable. The problem is that for each Fourier mode, you integrate a system of differential equation, and this has to be done sequentially, because each step in the integration depends on the previous step. And then we have a problem because the total computation, uh, computation time depends a lot on the wave number. And at the end, the reason for which you cannot scale well is that the computation of time is dominated by the time it takes to compute just one Fourier mode the biggest scale, which has the biggest computational time. If you want to beat this barrier, you need to be very creative and think of a whole new way to formulate the problem. And this is a very big challenge. Uh, we have some ideas about that and I find it very exciting. So the dream, I think, is that for a high precision calculation of CMB and matter or spectra, now when we run the Markov chain on 8 cores, it takes about 4 seconds. I think the dream, if you are clever with all what I presented before, is that we could go down to 0.1 second on 1 zero 5 for instance. And that's really a dream, because the parameter extraction that you would do in 10 hours would be done in 15 minutes. And then you could start to play with combination of many complicated models, and you would start to be in good shape. I think there is also a lot of progress to be done on tools for parameter extraction. If, if we don't do it, we are not ready to face this challenge. For the moment, we have some rather simple uh, tools for doing Bayesian parameter extraction. There is Cosmo MC, there is a Monte Python project, which is developed also by our group, and there are many other very good tools, and I think there will be more in the future. And for the moment, they focus on one technique. So, for instance, in the Monte Python project, you can switch between the different algorithms used for parameter extraction, Metropolis has things, Multinest, something called ENCDE, which is uh, much more uh, refined than the Metropolis has things algorithm. It uses several uh, random walks which are correlated to each other. But this is still very naive. I think that if we want to gain all the magnitudes in the way to solve this problem, we need to have clever sequences. Like for instance, I want to compare a model. My goal should start to do a minimization to find the best fit. Then maybe we should try to guess uh, the, the shape of the good fitting region by computing there's a feature matrix or something more clever than the feature matrix at a higher level. Given this information, we should start something with metropolis aesthetics in order to get a better idea of the good fitting region. But at some point, in order to be really fast, it would be clever to switch to Cosmo Hammer because Cosmo Hammer is very good for finishing the, group, the job if you have many CPUs available for a short amount of time. This is a possible sequence, but for different models, this might not be optimal. You could try to run a, a different sequence. And I think that ultimately, you want to be the toolbox that will decide automatically what to do and when to switch by running some diagnostic uh, tests, some on that will give you the performance of the cluster at a given time and how your previous step has behaved. And we are very really still far from that, but we are working on that. We are working on it in the context of this Monte Python project, which is a very modular toolbox for cosmology, uh, where you have a module uh, talking to different possible Boltzmann solver, a module talking to different attributes, and a module talking to different uh, something algorithm, but 
Again, for the moment, like in any competing code, you have to choose which one you want to use from the beginning. And I think the future is to have some way to, intellig to automatically and intelligently switch from one to the other. So many challenges, and my summary is the following, so actually one minute of delay, but I hope that's okay. So I think it, cosmology, even if you focus on linear scales, is still full of challenges. There are some uh, exciting increase in the discovery potential that you could get from future large-scale structure and CMD experiments. Many uh, experiments like, for instance, the Euclid project have been approved. Now we are trying hard to get Corplus uh, approved. It's a, it's a new CMD uh, satellite submitted to ESA that will do a great job with uh, CMD polarization and CMD lensing extraction. There is a very exciting range of reasonably motivated lambda CDM extensions. I'm not the kind of, of people who like to complicate model unnecessarily and are many parameters when the data is not requiring it. The thing is that there are motivation from particle physics, which are not yet decisive, but which are hints, that we have to search for more refinement in the light training sector and the dark matter sector. And there are also good theoretical arguments, as you know, that uh, cosmological constant is not a very um, appealing solution to the acceleration of the universe. It's a solution with the smallest number of parameters, but it raises lots of theoretical questions. So we have many motivations for, look, for looking at this more complicated model. Theorists have made a lot of progress. Now I would say this progress needs to propagate to the astrophysics community. But for that, because the model are getting so rich and so complicated, we need to climb a barrier in our uh, toolbox. We need much better performing Boltzmann codes, uh, more unified picture of what parameterization to use, and much better performing codes for parameter extraction. So, I find all this extremely exciting. It's, it's a lot of fun to work on this because the physics is relatively simple, it's beautiful. You can simulate, uh, when you study only linear scales, you can simulate the universe on your laptop in a fraction of a second, so it's extremely rewarding. There are lots of ways to show imagination, and I want to tell to young people that if you are interested in that, if you know master students who are uh, potentially interested by this kind of problem, there is still a lot of fun, a lot of things to do in this area, and if you are interested, don't hesitate to uh, contact me and, and think of, of collaborations. Thank you. for this interesting talk. I'm sure that we have several questions. Yes? Do you think it's possible to optimize on the observation side? So, for example, we find other observables which are linear for a longer time than the observables you are currently using. Um, yes, I think that, uh, for instance, if you have, um, if you have um, a big redshift, galaxy redshift survey, I think that by looking at correlation between different beams and different observables, different way of building observables, uh, different way to play and to separate things like redshift, space distortion, effects like that, I think it's possible that some effects are uh, some observables are more affected than others by nonlinear correction. And I think we, we give example of, of this in, uh, in some paper we did with a group of Geneva of Fruit here. Um, so, yeah, there, there are possibilities like that to, to treat the data better in order to like isolate as much as possible the linear information. But uh, not in a spectacular way. Um, what else? Uh, well, there are some ways to, to, of course, as you know, uh, when, when you look and you try to measure the DAO scale, there are some ways to, to, to remove, to some extent, nonlinear correction, to do this reconstruction, in order to go back to a picture which looks more linear. 
So this is an example where what you say would work. Other questions? Sensitive to 
particular information plan, not to others. Yeah. To sectors and not to other sectors. Yeah. So uh, if you have any comments on that, I just wanted to point out that uh, you've lost it. You can extend in other direction. Yeah, yeah. I, I, can, I can beat a combination of observables such as I will test only directly deviation from the machine variety, something like that. Yeah, sure. More questions? This is not the case, but thank you very much for this challenge.